Hey, what's up? I'm X, and today I'm going to teach you all of the essentials for the Chambers of Zarek. We're going to cover every room quickly and efficiently. Liking, commenting, and subscribing on this video is the only way that it will get suggested when people search COXOSRS Guide, so thanks in advance for that. Let's get right into it. I'm going to explain every room in the most bare bones way possible, but just know that there are a million and ten different strategies to do these rooms, but I will be covering the most popular and consistent ways. Take the mountain guide or the minecart or just walk up Mount Quidamortem and when you're here, make sure that you're in a friends chat and go over to the board and create a party. This is where you'll decide what scaling to make the raid and if it's a challenge mode or not. When you head in, the Runelight COX plugin will give you a layout of the raid on the screen. It's up to you what you'd like to do and if you don't like the raid, right click the stairs and hit reload until you have something that you like. For learners, People usually recommend to do only Mutadiles and Tecton as your big bosses of the raid, but you can do whatever works for you and your group. I don't want to get too deep into how to gear for COX because that usually takes upwards of 10 minutes in these guides, but here are three screenshots from the We Do Raids Discord at three different price points. Feel free to upgrade or downgrade how you see fit. Here's a quick rundown of the rooms. Tecton is a big boy with a big melee arm. He's got a lot of defense and he's mainly weak to crush. But this doesn't mean that you are forced to use Crush, however. The Fang on Stab, the Scythe on Slash, and the Dragon Hunter Lance on Crush all work fine. Reducing his defense is important, however. A recent change has made it so that the first Dragon Warhammer on him will always hit. Do aim to get as many Warhammers and BGS as you possibly can. You can send out a brave tribute to pull his attention while the team gets ready. Pray melee and hit him with all of your specs. Then you'll run around him like so, hitting him on the last corner tiles around him. Try to stay in sync with your team. He will eventually wander back to his anvil and start to heal. When he does this, sparks will fly wherever you were standing. Just run two tiles when you see those sparks and you'll be okay. He will then pick a new tank and you'll resume just as you were before. If nobody is around him, then he will walk back to the anvil immediately, so be careful not to leave him alone. Moving on to Mutadile, or Mutadile. This room is incredibly simple. There's a baby and a mama Mutadile. They are identical aside from their strength and hit points. You can use Mage on the baby and Range on the mom. Try to stay away from their bite range at all times. Once you've attacked them to about 40% of their hit points, they will walk over to the tree and heal up all of the way. They will do this three times. You can avoid this mechanic, however, by either cutting down the tree with any axe or freezing the Mutadile before it gets to the tree. With Ancients, or a Tentacle Whip, or a Zamorak Godsword, your choice. Mystics. Mystics is a relatively easy room. Simply hit a skeletal mystic wearing a salve EI and your best ranged armor. Or you can use a shadow with an occult if you've got that. Pray mage and try to keep only one of them aggressive at a time. Pulling multiple of them can run you out of supplies very quickly. There is a pseudo safe spot you can pull off by getting them stuck diagonally like this. The reason this works is they believe that they can reach you to melee you, so they will skip attacks trying to do so. Kill them all and the room is finished. Tightrope. Head into the tightrope room and your objective is to get the keystone that's sitting across the tightrope and use it on the barrier. The archers and the majors will try to stop you. You can either eliminate them all, best way being to hit them one at a time all together, or just tank them all and cross. And have your friends tag each of them across the way. Any combination of these things works fine. The majors are pushovers but the rangers are not, and the best way to handle the rangers is to shoot them once, pray range, and then hide behind this plant while your teammates shoot them then pop out every two shots or so, so that they don't change targets. Thieving. Click the various lock chests and gather as many grubs as you can to fill the scav beast's trough. One chest in the room will have consumable bats that will heal you for about 20 each. Even if you've just looted a chest, so long as it's closed, it will still have grubs in it again. A lock pick does make this room faster, but it's hardly necessary. Use grubs on the trough until you don't get points, that's when you'll know you're done. Guardians. Make sure you bring your best pickaxe into the raid and make sure that your combat style is on smash. Stand on this line and click the guardian to attack, and run back to this starting tile. If you need a visual cue, you can wait for the guardian's sword to be back upright. Try to sync this up with your teammates to reduce the damage taken. You can also run like this to conserve run energy. Vasa. Vasa is a big wall for some players learning how to do COX at times. It's a big DPS checkpoint. When you walk into Vasa's room, he will teleport everyone in the room either right next to him or among the walls. 
He's at this point checked the average HPs of all the players and will be hitting you based on that. A popular tactic is to eat really high and then have everybody vengeance his HP away. Being lower HP otherwise is recommended. If you are one of the players who was thrown to the wall, run towards the middle before the explosion goes off and pray mage if you're trying to avoid damage and range if you aren't. The player stunned in the middle can only really spam click Vasa and eat while dazed. When the explosion happens, Vasa will start walking around the room to one of his crystals to heal. Your job is to range him until he reaches one. When he does make it to one, Put on your best melee gear and attack the crystal from the side that he isn't on. Stab works best on the crystals, but use whatever you have. When the crystal dies, start shooting Vasa again. Move two tiles between rock throw attacks. This process will continue again with him reaching another crystal. After he's absorbed a certain amount of HP from his crystals, he will do the same explosion from the start. This usually happens on the third crystal, but it could be earlier or later, depending on your damage. Keep shooting him, and you'll be set. If you find yourself stuck being hit rapidly by him trampling you, just run through him. Vanguards. They're not too scary, but they are definitely strong. There is a melee, a mage, and a ranged vanguard. They can be hit with anything, but they are weakest to their combat triangle counterparts. Range the major, mage the meleeer, and melee the ranger. Their sightlines are pretty good. The best way to do this is to stick to the corners that they were in and work them slowly with your teammates. The trick with this room is that they all have to remain within 33.3% of their HP at any given time, otherwise they will all heal to full. This room takes a lot of coordination, but it gives a lot of supplies as well. Vespula Vespula is a big bug, but nothing to be afraid of. She's actually not even who we fight in this room. Your target is the Abyssal Portal, and you'll want a stamina for this room. Use your best long-range weapon or a trident slash a shadow. Make sure your offensive prayer and redemption are your quick prayers. All you'll do is run straight into Vespula praying redemption and attack the portal. This will drag you into a little cove in front of the portal. Once you've attacked, run straight to this tile here and repeat. When your redemption does go off, sip a prayer potion, turn your prayers back on, and repeat. If the grubs along the starting area start to lose their progress bar, you can refill it by grabbing the flowers in the room and using it on them. Most times you do not have to worry about this though. You only have to worry about eating if your HP is below 10. Crabs. Unironically the hardest room in COX, if your friends are idiots. A hammer or a warhammer in your inventory helps this room a lot. Your goal is to guide the floating white orb coming out of the wall into different colored crystals. You will color the crabs with the corresponding colors as well. You need to position the crabs as mirrors to bonk the orb into the right crystal. The easiest way to do this is to have two players be the anchors, meaning that they go towards the bottom of the room and send the light orb up to another player who will send it into the right crystal. Hit the crab with the appropriate attack style to change the color of it when the orb hits it. When this happens, the orb will be recolored. The purple crystal needs to be hit with a green or a range. The yellow crystal needs a blue or a mage. The black needs a white orb, which means no attack styles at all and the blue crystal needs a red orb, which is melee. Right-clicking the crab and hitting smash will keep them in place if you have a hammer or a warhammer. Keeping in mind that this smash timer will be bigger or smaller depending on how many players are in the raid. Ice Demon. Ice Demon is the lamest room in the raid. When entering the room, the path will have a lot of trees, an axe, and a tinderbox. Grab an axe and a tinderbox and begin to start chopping up to 28 kindling. Once you've got enough, Head over to one of the braziers and light the fire. The braziers without the ice fiends next to them last longer, and using only one brazier gets you more points but is a slower start. Once the ice demon's health is depleted, he will take a couple steps forward and start chucking snowballs. Make sure you're praying range if he looks at you. Run two tiles from where you were stood. The further back you are, the more time you'll have to react. Fire spells absolutely ruin him, but sometimes it's not worth bringing in standard spells for. A Dragon Warhammer spec on him will make the room a lot easier too. Simply range him with either a Blowpipe or a Tebow. It's also worth noting, only one person needs to be running around. The rest of the team can wait by the wall that is illuminated and be completely safe, like shown here. Shamans. These guys are just Lizardmen Shamans. If you've ever fought them for a Warhammer before, they're the exact same guys. However, you're not wearing Shazian armor, so the splat attack can hurt you. Hug the walls and shoot them with something. If they cock their shoulders back, run three tiles from where you were standing and be praying range the whole time. Try not to attract all of their attentions at once. If they spawn the little purple minions, just make sure you're not next to them when they explode after a few seconds. 
bring an anti-poison or anti-venom in any raid that has shamans in it. Now that's every room. Awesome job for making it this far. Now let's cover prep and prep in groups. When you're finished with the final room listed, you will have a farming prep room. Most importantly in groups, you'll want to make sure that you upgrade the bank. You can do this by killing scavenger beasts throughout the raid or just going back to prep. Also while killing scavenger beasts, you should be looking to gather as many Sicily, in dark and juice, and stink horn mushrooms as possible as your secondaries for the potions you'll be making. Also in the scav room are shortcuts that you and your team can clear for about 500 points each so long as you do them in sync. Now that your chest is built and you have secondaries, what now? Many of the bosses in the raid drop seeds. If you have not collected these seeds throughout the raid, head over to the tools on the wall and grab a rake. Take this rake to the final room and rake the weed patch. Buchu is the most important seed, but you may need Nox, Fur, and Golpar. Buchu creates brews, restores, and prayer enhances, which will give you prayer over time. Golpar and Noxifer are both used in tandem to create overloads, which you may wish to save time by simply saving the overloads from rooms prior. Use the same tool pile and grab a seed dibber as well as a spade to plant and pick the plants. Clean the Buchu plants that you pick and put them in the shared storage for your team to see. Be aware, Iron Man, that you will be unable to retrieve anything from Shared if you place it in there. When farming in groups, make sure that you all pick from the same plant, as if both of the plants expire at the same time, you will have to wait for new ones to grow, leaving you basically useless until that happens. The lower the farming, the more likely it is to break. Now, all you need is vials of water. Locate the gourd tree and right-click it to pick lots. This will fill your inventory. Use either Humidify on the Lunar Spellbook or the Water Geyser in the room. Now on to making potions. This is a standard herb lore fair. I like to grab 10 vials of water, 10 buchu, and then 10 of the secondary that I'm trying to make. We are aiming for about 10 brews per person, four to five restores, one overload, and one prayer enhance. You may want to put a person on farming, scavenging, and someone on vials to make prep a lot faster. You can also keep all of your items safely in the private chest. They will be stored outside when you leave. Once that's all done, we're heading into the big room. The final phase, the big kahuna, Ohm. Now this is going to be a lot of information for my ADHD viewers. I sympathize with you and I want to make this as digestible as possible. First, I'm going to show you a layout of the room. Then I'm going to go over each of his attacks and what to do if they happen to you. Then I'm going to talk you through what you actually will be doing in an average raid. This is Ohm's room. Ulm is a canonically blind dragon. Because of this, he only really knows where you are based on where you hit him or where the most players are. That's very important to know going forward. There are three sections of the Ulm room. Let's say for this instance that he spawned on the east side. The right side of the room is his melee side. The left side of the room is his mage side. And the middle is what we call the runners. The mage role is to not cross over this line. The melee roll is to not cross over this line, and the runners in the middle will run opposite the way that Ulm is facing to shift the balance of how many players there are in the room to move his head. The major will mage the left hand. The runners will run in opposite directions that Ulm is facing and will mage the same hand as the major. The meleeer off to the right will stay put and melee the right hand. In the Tile Packs plugin, there is a pack called COX Ulm Standard which gives you the very basic tiles that you'll need. The white tiles indicate the lines that shouldn't be crossed as well as the lines to run between for the players in the middle. The two black tiles represent the thumb tile. This is a tile used universally as a meeting spot for some special attacks that we're going to talk about now. For Ulm's first two phases, he can choose randomly any three powers to rise with, that being crystal, flame, and acid. These phases will give him an additional two special attacks that he can do during these specific phases, or in the third phase where he has access to all of them. If he rises with the power of crystal, he may throw bombs. He will throw bombs in the room and when they detonate, you wanna be at least five tiles away from them. The closer you are, the more dangerous. He has another attack where he will select a player to be chosen and then crystals will fall overhead where you're standing. You basically just need to make sure that you're walking around or at least not standing where the crystals are landing. If he rises with acid, he can randomly shoot out a lot of acid globs onto the battlefield. Just don't step in them and you'll be okay. He can also cover one player in acid. Everywhere they walk will reproduce the same acid spots for a while. The best way to navigate this attack is to turn on your walk and just try not to overlap the acid that you've made. If he rises with his most annoying phase, flame, he has two attacks he may do. 
his flame wall, which can be avoided if you know it's coming, otherwise you'll be sandwiched between two firewalls. Using some form of water spell, ice barrage, humidify, or just a standard water spell, or a gourd full of water, will create a gap in which you can escape. Simply left-clicking the wall will automatically use it. Typically, one player will have water spells and shout the direction on which to run through the wall, the burn. Ulm will choose any one player to burn. This player's stats and HP will be drained over time. The annoying part of this attack is that if you're stood next to the player who is burning, when they go to say, burn with me, you will burn with them and prolong this effect. The best way to avoid this attack is to isolate and contain. Keep gaps when meleeing the hand together like so, and do your best to not be next to them. If you must meet up, do so as the player has the text over their head as they are only contagious before the character actually produces this message. These attacks, despite being pretty special, are not what people refer to as his special attacks. Ulm has his two auto attacks, a big puff of fire for mage and a little crystal for range. He does favor doing the same attacks over and over again, but he can totally swap it up if he wants to. These attacks can be subbed out for any of the previously mentioned attacks. His special attacks, however, will occur every two auto attacks. These special attacks are crystals, lightning, and teleports. They will loop in this order as well. After the first two auto attacks, there will be little crystals underneath your feet that you must move one tile off of to avoid taking damage. After another two auto attacks, Ulm will spawn lightning from the north and south wall that will go the opposite directions. Simply move out of the way of them or run through them when there are two tiles next to you. And finally, teleports. You and another player will be paired to meet up. You will take five damage for every tile that you're not stood on top of each other. People will generally use the thumb tile to avoid this attack. Those are all of his attacks, now let's get into how to actually do this boss. Those previous attacks are going to be something that you're just going to have to get used to with practice, and do not worry, nobody does COX too great their first couple times. Seriously. Before going in, figure out who's doing what roles. Usually one person will melee, one person will mage, and then the rest will be runners. When you head in, everybody will use their warhammers or bandos godswords on the melee hand, and then head off to their specific roles. The mages will head to the left side, and the melee will stay behind. The melee's job is easy. Keep meleeing until the hand cripples from taking too much damage. This may happen instantly. At which point you'll stand on your normal tile and long range mage the left hand. The runners, after specking, will run to the left side of the middle and start maging. When Ulm looks to the left, they run two tiles to the right. When he looks to the right, they run two tiles to the left. They continue to do this throughout the rest of the raid. They should never get hit if this job is done correctly. The mage can just stand on the left side and mage the hand without moving. There is a method called skipping that the melee and mage do, but I'll show you how to do that another time. Just know that when Ulm moves his head, he does this in place of an attack. You can manipulate him in a way to make him move his head instead of doing a special attack. When you have all killed the mage hand, everybody will join the melee and kill the right hand. Make sure that you leave gaps between you all, just in case you have the burn attack on you. When the hand dies, he will drop crystals from the ceiling that you need to move two tiles from, and then he will spawn on the other side. You're going to start with your warhammers again, and then do the exact same thing as before. Phase 3 we do a little bit differently. Both hands have to die at roughly the same time, so to help the meleeer achieve this damage, after specking at the start you'll stay meleeing until the teleport attack goes off. When the teleport attack goes off, all players will run to the left side of the middle and wait for him to turn his head to skip the healing phase. If you hit his hand when it has an infinity symbol above it, he will start to heal. After that teleport, it's business as usual. Just make sure that you're checking in with your teammates for hand health updates. Now we're in the final phase, the head phase. During this phase, you will continue your same positions and movement and swap over to range gear. He gains one special ability in the form of a little blue spot that he will put on the ground and he will heal for every person not standing on it. If this attack is really far from you, just don't worry about it. Avoid the falling crystals from before and don't get overwhelmed. Once his head hits zero HP, you've done it. You've done a COX. I'd like to do videos on how to make solo attacking Ulm a little bit easier for you as well as how to skip in teams for both mage and melee skipping. I figured that this video would be long enough without them and I want to thank you all for sticking with me and thank you for watching and all that stuff. Please subscribe, please like, comment, uh, share on Google+, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.